वसुदेव सुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु We are on the sixth chapter in the Bhagavad Gita. Yes. And towards the end of the sixth chapter. And the sixth chapter is about meditation. We saw that at the end of the chapter, Arjuna asks a question to Krishna. That suppose I do not attain enlightenment in this lifetime. Then what's going to happen to me? I have shraddha, I have faith in the teachings and I'm going to practice it. But suppose I do not attain enlightenment, if I um, do not attain the goal of yoga, then what's going to happen to me? Will everything be lost? And Krishna assures him that those who walk on the path of uh, spirituality, those who walk on the path of um, enlightenment, spiritual realization, they never come to a bad end. And he, he says to uh, Arjuna that even if one does not attain enlightenment in this very lifetime, one will go after death to the highest possible heaven in you know, whatever worlds the meritorious persons go to after death. And having stayed there for a long time, will again come back to this mortal world and you'll be born uh, in favorable circumstances, um, you are, uh, you'll be born to a good family, you will have no material wants, and they'll be prosperous and they'll be um, devout, uh, or at the very least, ethical, good, good people. And in the rarest of cases, he says, that one might even get a very rare kind of birth where one's own parents are advanced spiritual seekers. They are yogi nami kule in the family of father and mother are, are uh, yogis. And he says this is a very rare birth because it's a sign of um, that in that very life you will be enlightened. And I don't know if I mentioned it last time, but it just goes to show uh, how much uh, important uh, or what how significant the role of parents is in our life, I mean, quite apart from spirituality, whatever we are in our lives, the tremendous impact of our parents. If having this kind of parents, you are yourself a yogi who's practiced yoga for uh, maybe lifetime or more lifetimes, but it takes being born into a family which is very spiritual, uh, which guarantees your enlightenment in that very lifetime. So that was, I think that's where we had stopped. Verse number 42. Yes. Atava yogi nam eva kule bhavati dhimatam etadhi durlabhataram loke janma yadidrisham. That is verse number 42. Now what does that mean? That this is a rare birth that one may get. Sufficiently advanced spiritual seeker with lots of good karma. You're born to a family of spiritual seekers or advanced spiritual seekers. And very rare is this birth. What will happen in that birth? What will happen um, once this person who has not attained enlightenment, but did pursue a spiritual path uh, in an earlier life? And what will happen to this child? 43rd verse. Tatratam buddhisang yogam labhate paurvadehikam Yatate cha tato bhuya samsiddhau kuru nandana. There he comes in contact with the knowledge acquired in the previous birth and strives harder than before for perfection. O descendant of Kuru, that is Arjuna. So, O Arjuna, this child will now, in this child will awaken the uh, wisdom gained in earlier births and will once again strive for enlightenment in this very life itself. Um, so, Tatra, there. There means where? Now, one commentator says, Shankaracharya actually says, in that rare birth where your 
parents are spiritual seekers but you can send it to any kind of birth even the, uh, the general case of we were spiritual seekers in past lives now we have come back to this life so wherever you are what will happen is you come into contact with the wisdom gained in past lives and this awakens in this life and one tries again for um, enlightenment one walks the path of spiritual practice now the um, commentator here makes a point that if there is bad karma uh, from past lives then the wisdom which is gained in past lives remains suppressed so that, that person in this life may lead up you know a pretty worldly life may do things which everybody else does but at one time the effect of that bad past karma will wear off and this um, this spiritual seeking will surface it will blossom again and if there isn't any particularly bad karma then from the very childhood you will see this kind of um, blossoming of of uh, or or an awakening of a desire for enlightenment the point he wants to make is that uh, the result of the spiritual practices of past lives is not destroyed it may not manifest immediately see somebody becomes a spiritual seeker later in life so does that mean that i was not a yogi in past lives i was not a spiritual seeker and this is my first first life because i didn't have these interests when i was a child um so it means no it just means that some karma was obstructing it now that is gone and your uh, past life's practices have taken hold the results of spiritual practices done in past lives are never destroyed they will always be there sri so ramakrishna makes it very clear he gives the example of the seed uh, of of a tree if it falls on fertile ground it will sprout but suppose it falls on a roof rooftop or something like that one day uh, in years decades or centuries later that house will collapse and the seed is not destroyed it will fall finally come in contact with the ground and it will sprout so the seed of spirituality is not destroyed uh, other types of karmas may come and go the results will come and will be exhausted but this seed of spirituality which is it is also a practice you may say it might be wiped out if if uh, no you if nothing happens any further but it will not be wiped out that's what krishna wants to say it will be there forever and one day it will surely give its result and you will walk the path of uh, spiritual seeking once again the next question is that he comes in this person comes in contact with the wisdom gained in past lives so buddhi sangyogam that is the uh, term used and what does this mean the wisdom gained in past lives so if somebody has completed up to the 6th chapter of the bhagavad gita do you start from the 7th chapter in the next life um, do if you memorize some verses do you remember all of that no not like that it's not that um, you've completed half the library in this life and then you get to complete the other half of the library in the next life it's not like that what happens is uh, the samskaras the tendencies which are strengthened in this life which are accumulated in this life they will come forth in the next life with renewed vigor with with uh, extraordinary power we may not remember we may not remember being a yogi or a yogini in past lives we may not remember that we were in such and such place and we did these spiritual practices we may not remember but we will notice something in that child a liking for spirituality an interest may be um you know in ashrams or um, you know temples or uh, bhajans or something connected to spirituality or on, in books of philosophy and spirituality some kind of pull you will find uh, and things which might be not interesting to others which might even be difficult to others this child finds it pretty easy because this is something that this child has experienced in past lives um so concepts of philosophy teachings of yoga vedanta will all come very easily uh, it and also it will feel it some things will feel familiar it will feel that i have i have known this earlier i have seen this earlier or i have felt this earlier 
like a like a deja vu, not exactly a deja vu, but a bit like that. So these things will come in this life, and there are many such people. Um, these people make much faster progress in spiritual life. We were always told by senior sadhus when we would see some extraordinary monk, and the common phrase in Bengali would be, which other senior monks would tell us, "Or agjan me shadhuna." They are not monks of of one birth. They have been uh, monks in past birth or spiritual seekers at least in past births who have not attained enlightenment but now you see them extraordinary in this life but that being extraordinary has been gained painstakingly in past births so krishna says coming back to this world again you will gain the benefit of that you will not get the actual memory of that knowledge but you will get the benefit of those practices in this life you will start from there Uh, so i have told you earlier also i have seen among monks everybody has come there to be a monk you know in our, our monastery uh, everybody wants to become enlightened but why is it for some you know waking up uh, early in the morning and sitting and meditating and chanting all of these are are joyful they're eager to do it and for others who want to become enlightened and yet it's all very difficult getting up in the morning is difficult meditating you feel sleepy this books and vedanta feels boring and why and uh, bhakti practices are there there is no inspiration from within it is all because that has not been done yet that is uh, yet to be covered yet to be done we have we are going through that process now what will happen number 44 पूर्वाभ्यासेनेवा Purvabhyasa means the weight or the inertia of past practice. Past practice, past lives. There is a power which has been generated. We have set into motion these subtle energies which are now played out in this life. And this person, Hyavasha, what a, what a, uh, uh, Avasha means irresistibly. Even you may not even particularly be interested. And yet things will fall in place. You will get the right books, the right teachers. the right uh, things will come together at the same, at the at the right time and uh, things will happen one after another whereas for another person every every little bit of progress in spiritual life might be the might have to fight against endless obstructions and this person everything comes up one after another it's because this person has already done all that earlier it's already it belongs to them and irresistibly krishna says such is the power of past past spiritual practices you will not have any more choice in it you will be swept towards <laughs> you'll swept towards god you'll be swept towards enlightenment in this life even an inquirer after yoga that is yoga is spiritual practice in general i mean specifically i mean vedanta yoga but in general somebody who's interested in spirituality even a person who's just interested in spirituality uh, exceeds just those who are um, you know who are learned in the vedas or who may have a many more conventional religiosity the difference i'm making here is this between what i would like to call a higher religion and the lower religion between spirituality and conventional religiosity conventional religiosity i'm not particularly interested in religion whatever your religion may be but i do every, what everybody else does i have a sort of vague belief in god yeah i think god may exist and of course i go to temple or church and especially when i there's something to be done i want to pass an examination i, I know some young people told me the only time we would go to the uh, temple in our uh, college or university campus was just before examinations so <laughs> what does that mean i have a general uh, belief that there might be some such power and when i really really need something i desperately appeal to any power whatever can help me but my eyes are not on that ultimate reality my eyes are very much on this world 
So conventional religiosity, and many, many people are religious in that way, and nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it. That is called mass religion. That's how mass religion survives everywhere across the world. But in contrast to this are the spiritual inquirers. Can I actually experience God? Can I realize God? Can I experience God? Um, is it possible to be illumined, to know who I am really? Is it possible to go beyond sorrow? Um, so these are the deep fundamental questions, the big questions. If you are seeking answers to these questions, you are a spiritual seeker. And he says, just a person who has not even started practicing, even a person who is interested in this, he says he exceeds, uh, goes beyond, is superior to the conventionally religious person. So Vedanta is the higher spirituality. Yoga is the higher spirituality. Bhakti, by bhakti again I mean, Parabhakti, uh, not Parabhakti exactly, what is called Naradiya Bhakti. That means Bhakti devotion for God realization. Otherwise, there's a lot of other kind of devotion also. People generally have a kind of you know, uh, practical faith in God. Uh, that is not meant here. It is devotion to God for the sake of God. Yoga, meditation for the sake of enlightenment. The pursuit of knowledge for the sake of self-realization. All of these, this is the person who is even interested in these things is actually superior to the conventionally religious person. Shabda Brahma here means Vedas. Then next uh, mantra, uh, next, uh, next verse. Prayatna dhyatama nastu yogi samshuddha kilbisha anekrajanma sansiddha tato yati parangatim Verily, a yogi who practices assiduously, being purified by uh, purified from all sins, is perfected through many births and then attains the supreme goal. So, why is a yogi superior, even a person who's just starting out? Because by the practice of, um, by spiritual practice, by devotion, by meditation, and by uh, self inquiry one can overcome he says, all the impurities, all the trash that we have collected in life after life, and then ultimately realize one's true nature. God realization, the realization of Brahman, Moksha, Nirvana, Satori, whatever you call it, it is entirely possible. Over, and this is a, an effort of lifetimes, Aneka Janma Samsiddhi, by Progress through lifetimes. Aneka janma samsiddhi. Tato yati param gatim. And thereby goes to the ultimate goal of moksha, liberation. Freedom from the cycle of birth and death. Attaining to your infinite nature. So this is the great human adventure. If you're doing it knowingly, you are a spiritual seeker. You are a yogi. If, you say, if somebody says, I have no belief in these such things. In that case, we're drifting from from one thing to another, lifetime after lifetime, but we're still seeking the same thing, unknowingly. We just call it, I'm living my life. Or as we would say, living your lives in the plural, one after another. And one day we will all come to this. Just one point here, let this, this progress through many lifetimes culminating in ultimate liberation or spiritual realization, let it not be discouraging. Oh, many lifetimes. I think then I'm several lifetimes away from it. May not be. We have no idea when we'll become enlightened. When it happens, it can happen suddenly. So it can happen in this very life. This is entirely possible. Entirely possible. And one should always proceed in with that assumption in mind. That it, it's going to happen in this lifetime itself. I want enlightenment, God realization in this lifetime itself. So help me God. Take the help of Ishwara, Bhagawan, God. Ask for that blessing. May I be enlightened in this lifetime. Even if, even if just at the point of death also. That's more than enough. So in this lifetime itself, I will realize God. That should be our attitude. So isn't it an overly ambitious thing? Not necessarily. You see, what we, we need Sri Ramakrishna would give the example of the mountain of sugar and the ant who discovered that mountain of sugar and it dragged away 
one grain of that sugar with great difficulty to its hole and looking back it thought i'll come back for the whole mountain it doesn't have to it can't take the whole mountain back and it cannot come back for the whole mountain all it needs to fill its little belly is that one grain of sugar we are like that little ant all we need is that one touch of that infinite once you touch that that the limited individuality dissolves and you are one with the infinite so we don't the goal is that you don't have to become like vivekananda or ramakrishna or jesus or buddha that's not the point the point is to become enlightened and realize that you are brahman and be free of this travail of lifetimes of sorrow and toil so aneka janma many lives how do you know that you have not traversed many lifetimes of effort so this might be the culmination it's quite possible then further krishna says uh, verse number 46 tapasvibhyo dhiko yogi gyani bhyopi mato dhika karmi bhyascha dhiko yogi tasmat yogi bhava arjuna yogi is regarded as greater than ascetics greater than even the men of knowledge and greater than also those devoted to work therefore be a yogi o arjuna so this is more this chapter is about yoga the yoga of meditation specifically so he is telling arjuna to practice the yoga of meditation and this is more advertisement that the yoga of meditation is the best of all tapas vibhyo adhiko yogi so the commentators help us here they tell us what is meant by these uh, tapasvi means a person who practices austerities so somebody who practices many fasts there are many people who fast on uh, this particular occasion on some you know so that kind of um, disciplines higher than that is this spiritual path of meditation you know trying to become enlightened through meditation knowledge and meditation this is much higher gyani bhyopi mato dhika is higher than uh, the person of knowledge the knowledge here means commentator says shastra gyana that means a person who has uh, read the scriptures who may know lots of sanskrit verses um sanskrit grammar and logic and all of that is a pandit is a scholar higher than that is the person who is actually practicing spiritual disciplines right here spiritual discipline of course means meditation uh, but if you are actually a spiritual seeker you are practicing it your goal is god realization um then you are higher than a person who just knows the scriptures and i've seen this um there are many pandits who are well versed in vedanta but their goal is not uh, enlightenment the goal might be to get a degree or uh, publish a paper or get a teaching position in a university or give lectures that's the goal and um, the 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 urgent feeling that god realization enlightenment is possible and that's what i want above all things that's not there compared to such uh, scholars a spiritual seeker who may not know much knows just enough i have got the mantra from the guru i know how to meditate i have firm belief that god exists i'm meditating on god or i have studied vedanta under the, a teacher and i know the way to discern my own witness that i am the witness consciousness not body and not mind and this really seems this seems true to me and i'm trying to establish myself in that you know this is a spiritual seeker this is superior such a person krishna calls a yogi who systematically practices spiritual disciplines and this person is higher than greater than a scholar karmi bhyas chadiko yogi here um, uh, he means by karmi the person of action he means vedic action that means the person who performs vedic rituals higher than that is the yogi the meditator uh, higher than a ritualistic person is the meditative person it's a superior form of spiritual practice tasmat yogi bhava arjuna therefore o arjuna be a yogi you be a spiritual seeker a meditator then the last verse of this um, chapter yogi naam api sarvesham madgate nantaratmana shraddhavan bhajate yomam same yukta tamo matah of all yogis even he who possessed of faith worships me with his mind absorbed in me is in my opinion the greatest 
me here means god saguna brahman there might be um, people who practice various kinds of meditation you know mindfulness meditation of course let me give you first the technical meaning here and then i'll expand on it the commentators say that those who there might be yogis who meditate on other deities the lower deities but the greatest yogi is the one who meditates on god god is one there might be other kinds of uh, divine beings and some yogis meditate on that that's not meant here this uh, you're meditating on god but that's understood for us in our modern context we have this phenomenon of where meditation is very popular but krishna would not be happy here he is addressing this verse to such meditators why are you doing so much of mindfulness meditation productivity will improve you can make more profits immune system will become better aging will be retarded all these are good things yes they are all good things but that's not the point what krishna is trying to make here that's still pretty worldly that you are using the techniques of meditation to achieve a better worldly life nothing wrong in that but it's not spirituality it's not spirituality so if you if your goal is god realization that meditation is meant, meant here so this is the sixth chapter it is called dhyana yoga nama shashto adhyaya the sixth chapter of the bhagavad gita ends here and it is called um the way of meditation or yoga of meditation there is a, always these chapters when they end there is a concluding line which has to be chanted so i'll just chant it iti shrimad bhagavad gita su upanishad su brahma vidyayam yoga shastre shri krishna arjuna sanvade dhyana yoga nama shashto adhyaya hence ends um, the sixth chapter called the yoga of meditation in the dialogue this wonderful dialogue of krishna and arjuna this dialogue what is it about it's about brahma vidya yoga shastra it's a knowledge of brahman and the discipline of yoga and this is part of the bhagavad gita and gives bhagavad gita the stature of an upanishad bhagavad gita su upanishad su bhagavad gita is part of the mahabharata it's not an upanishad but um, it is it is so exalted it's treated as an upanishad it's treated at par as uh, with an upanishad all right let me quickly run through what was done in this chapter very quickly we have got some time um let me see should i take a look at the comments first and then go to the summary okay let me take a look at the comments just by the way before i forget we have actually reached a significant milestone in our study of the bhagavad gita the a certain uh, commentators divide the gita into three parts six chapters each 1 to 6 and then 7 to 12 and then 13 to 18 so we have finished six chapters some gave further significance to this the whole point of the gita is tat tvam asi that thou art you are brahman and the first six chapters 1 to 6 which we have done just now are supposed to be all about you your real nature tvam in uh, technical terms this is called tvam padartha shodhana and investigation or a uh, or a uh, uh, inquiry into the you into the the self individual self the next six chapters which we'll talk we'll see now from 7th to 12th is about tat tat means that and here it means god or more technically saguna brahman the absolute with attributes which is the god of religion so the uh, next six chapters will be about god and and it pretty much is true actually when you see from the seventh chapter onwards the emphasis shifts from our real nature as pure consciousness to god to devotion to faith yeah. all of that so the bhakti and all of that will come in now from the 7th to the 12th chapters and finally the last six chapters from 13th to 18th are about the identity of the individual and of the cosmic you the individual being and this god we are going to talk about in the next six chapters you and this god are one reality how is that possible i am this little creature i am arjuna this warrior prince and 
God is um, the cosmic being, the creator, preserver, destroyer of the universe. There's tremendous difference. It's like difference between a wave and the ocean. How can we be one? Well, you are one, not as an individual being, not as God, but as, as a fundamental reality which is beyond God and the individual, which is Brahman, the absolute. It is the absolute which appears as God, universe and individual. Jiva, Jagat, Ishwara. God, Ishwara, Jagat, universe and Jiva, you. So I will not go into that. That is the whole analysis of the Mahavakya, which we have done in Vedanta Sara and all of that. Anyway, my only point was we have done six chapters, which is the first one third of uh, the Bhagavad Gita. Now let me run through the questions. Sean Lee says, we all know life is unpredictable and we are reminded by that very often in the pandemic. How can we prepare our mind in this transient life? This is what Krishna says at the very beginning. Ja- and he says this, Jatasya dhruva mrityu, dhruvam janma mitasya cha. For those who are born, death is certain. Life and death come and go like shadows. He says even agama paino, anityan, he says in the second chapter, um, that in this life also, all that happens, the experiences that we have, the possessions that we have, even our, and our closest relatives, um, father, mother, husband, wife, children, grandchildren, all of it is transient. All of it is passing. Even this body, it will age and it will pass. For some, it will pass suddenly, quickly. And so um, Krishna, Krishna emphasizes this. Be aware of the transient nature of life. It is, there are many ways of um, describing it. In Buddhism, they talk about uh, it is like a bubble on a fast flowing river. See how transient it will be. Like a um, phantom in the dark, like a shadow you see in the dark. Children get scared of it. Our life is like that, like some kind of movement in the dark. We don't know what's going on. And like a flash of lightning in the night sky. So transient is our life. Another example is like a drop of a dew drop extended on the tip of a leaf. See, dew drops, they slowly roll up. So our life is a dew drop extended on the tip of a leaf. It's going to fall just now. So, yes, we must be aware of the transient nature of life. Nothing can um, stop it. Even Vedanta can't stop it. Vedanta can give you immortal life, but not in this body. Vedanta gives you immortal life because. You are immortal in your real nature. And that's revealed by Vedanta. All spiritual paths, they want to take you from death to immortality. All religions, actually, if you think about it. Some religions like Vedanta use very logical, philosophical language. Others use uh, a mythical language, language of faith or of uh, stories. But they, want, they all want to tell you the same thing. They want that you, to go beyond our mortality into immortality. That is the promise of every religion. But no religion says you can have it like this. Uh, right here on earth in this uh, uh, aging, dying body, you can't. And this will go. This can't be stopped. Um, John Anderson says, in this answer to Arjuna, what is the purpose of the time in the highest heaven before returning to birth in beneficial circumstances? Yes. Uh, if you refer back to Arjuna's question, that is both lost. If I don't attain enlightenment, so I didn't get the purpose of spiritual life. I mean, I didn't attain what was it I was trying to do. But in the meantime, I haven't done what other people are doing. They are uh, working to secure their conditions in this life. And they are performing all these wonderful Vedic rituals, which promise them going to heaven afterwards. So I'm not doing any of that. I've given up all those pursuits. Uh, the conventional religion, I'm not following that. So won't I go to heaven after death? I'm not getting enlightenment. Fine, then I'm going to still be as an individual being, just like everybody else. But this individual being which I am, what will it be? It's, what will be its fate? I don't have the good karma generated by all the rituals which all the others are doing. So Krishna says, you need not worry. You will go to heaven. Just like they, you will go to the highest heaven, you, that means nothing is lost for you. The spiritual path is such a wonderful path. You are not really losing anything in this life or the next. All of it will be there for you. You suffer no loss anywhere. Not only that, 
your spiritual progress is preserved you will start right there next life so it's a very uh, it's a um, wonderful message from krishna very very encouraging this is one path where you need not be discouraged at all rick says one thing may lead to the next many times i've seen people learn meditation to lower their blood pressure something mundane but after a while realize there's more to it and get inspired to higher values absolutely people come to spiritual path in so many ways i've seen yoga teachers who teach hatha yoga um, but as once they become teachers they want to know a little more about what they are teaching so then they study the yoga sutras from from there they come to philosophy they come to sanskrit they come to the gita so one thing leads to another sangeeta says why exactly does krishna say in this context that a yogi is superior to the man of knowledge a pandit yes is the drift that some are in direct experience emphasized as being superior versus knowing just theory more than experience practice more than experience practice and seeking one may read but one may not be interested in uh, pursuing that there are any number of scholars who are pretty well read in in philosophy um, in vedanta in then um, the uh, yoga sutras and I've, i've met people and the whole purpose of that is to get a teaching position you know in the philosophy department or somewhere in the, and they again as rick says they again will become interested and may actually become genuine spiritual seekers in time but for the time being since they are not spiritual seekers um, the spiritual seeker practitioner who is doing spiritual sadhana who is meditating doing karma yoga bhakti yoga who is doing shravana manana nidityasana you know systematically studying vedanta pursuing it that person is definitely superior okay now let me quickly run through what we have done Uh, in this what have we got in these in this sixth chapter it's a very wonderful chapter uh, personally a little dear to me because uh, when i became a monk uh, i mean as a novice our uh, superior the one who was in charge of that particular monastery that ashram he would ask us to memorize the gita and for some reason he would give different novices different chapters to memorize to start us off of course all 18 chapters would have to be memorized but you uh, start off somewhere and i was given the sixth chapter so i remember starting off on the sixth chapter what's there in the sixth chapter so this chapter is about meditation and um, before we meditate if you are meditating for spiritual realization our life must be uh, must be purified first so our actions the work that we do it must be not only moral that goes without saying you clean up your life in, in america they say clean up your act so clean up your act but also selfless convert our actions into a worship of god actions means everything that we do in uh, life driving cooking reading taking care of people around us doing a job yes you're doing a job for the um, for the salary but internally your attitude is now i'm going to do it for as a worship of god so the first thing krishna says in a chapter in meditation the first thing before meditation karma yoga is important so his first verse anashita karma phalam karyam karma karoti ya sa sanyasi cha yogi cha na niragni na cha akriya the one the karma yogi is the real yogi he says who does the work which comes to one slot whatever work it is whatever you are facing in life you do that without worldly motives you are not pursuing you know uh, you are not doing that i will get happiness out of this money i will get happiness out of this success or i'll get happiness out of this family you still have a family you have a job you have got money but now you are doing all of that as a uh, worship of god uh, your internal attitude externally people may not find uh, so much difference so you have converted your actions into karma yoga then he says in the third verse aruruksha munir yogam karma karana mutyate yoga arudasya tasseva shama karana mutyate he gives the structure of the uh, of the spiritual path um, those who have begun on the spiritual path for them karma yoga is important 
those who are pretty far advanced in the spiritual path, the mind has been purified. For them, meditation becomes important. Or meditation becomes really possible. So remember, I've always mentioned the, this matrix in which uh, the, the yogas and the, the, the roles that they play in our spiritual life. Mind is impure, mind has to be purified. For purification of mind, karma yoga is powerful. With a purified mind, next problem is mind is flickering. The flickering mind has to be quietened and focused. For that, the method is Raja Yoga, meditation. And the purified and focused mind, it will grasp the teachings of Vedanta very fast. So the third stage is you have got some amount of purity, you've got some amount of focus, and that mind can now grasp Vedanta very quickly, and that leads to um, illumination, enlightenment. See, three kinds of problems. The problem of impurity of mind. The problem of, uh, of the unsteady mind, flickering mind, lack of focus, concentration. And finally, the deepest problem of ignorance. The primal ignorance of not, not knowing what I am. The first one, impurity of mind, is knocked out. The method is, to, is karma yoga. The practice is karma yoga. The second one, and the, the focus of the mind, unsteady mind, that problem is knocked out by focus of mind and that is attained by meditation. And finally, the ignorance, the root problem that is overcome by knowledge and that knowledge is given by jnana yoga, which consists of shavana, manana, nididhyasana. Shavana, the systematic study of the Vedantic texts guided by competent teachers. Uh, manana, reflection, trying not to accept it. Somebody said to me, what is the need of all this logic chopping? You know, I just accept it. I believe it. No, that will not work in uh, the path of knowledge. You have to get it. What is being said here? So, uh, reasoning it out is important. And then, Vedantic meditation. So, what this chapter is about, Vedantic meditation. Actually, there are two kinds of meditation. It seems to be, you know, that uh, to focus the mind, meditation comes in there. And again, you are saying in Jnana Yoga also, there's another kind of meditation. So just keep that in mind. If you're interested, we'll talk a little more about it. But let's go ahead now. Having said that, beautiful verse, number five, Krishna says, Uddhare tatman atmanam natmanam avasadai atmai vahyatmano bandhu atmai varipur atmana. He says, lift yourself up by yourself. Make a change in your life. So here Krishna sounds a lot like Tony Robbins or something, you know, like a motivational speaker. You, this is the first thing that is needed in any kind of positive growth in life. Um, you know, whether personal wellness, um, change in your career, your relationships, or spiritual life. The possibility, the desire to be better off. To lift oneself up. So, and then he says, you are your best friend, you are your worst enemy. This is wisdom for the ages. It is true whether you are a yogi or not, it's always true. And when we are yogi, this becomes so much true. We see in spiritual path. In other paths, we can, uh, whether you are in a path of education, career, relationship, you can always blame other people. In a spiritual path, when you meditate and you're devoted, you notice every problem is internal problem, really. External problem, very little. It doesn't matter much what other people say or do. Everything that other people say or do can be converted into a spiritual practice for yourself. The problem is with, with one's own mind. So it becomes so clear. You are your own best friend. You are your own worst enemy. So evident in the spiritual path. Then... Um, then Krishna comes down to actual instruction on uh, meditation from the 10th verse onwards. So he says, first you find out a suitable spot, um, you know, solitude, and then what kind of spot is suitable for meditation. Then he gives detailed instructions. How do you sit? Where do you sit? Even the meditation mat he describes, what it's to be made of. How do you sit? The posture, how you have to sit straight uh, and relaxed. Uh, where do you keep your gaze, you know, to uh, enable focus? 
so what he does here we can recognize the well known stages of yoga in the patanjali yoga sutras the ashtanga yoga of the patanjali yoga sutras there the eight limbs yama and niyama 1 and 2 these are the moral and ethical disciplines this krishna has already talked about as um, the karma yoga portion of it then comes asana sitting and then comes pranayama control of the breath in order to quieten the mind then comes pratyahara withdrawal withdrawal withdrawing from engagement withdrawing the senses from engaging with the world but do you know this pratyahara withdrawing of senses i'll just mention something here uh, it is uh, actually a mental attitude of turning away from the world i'm very interested in what's going on what people are saying behind my back and i put ear plugs that is not pratyahara i want to know but i'm trying not to hear that will not work i am not interested that is pratyahara a very great monk of our order very senior monk of our order i heard this story from just um, today or yesterday from a visiting monk who had come and he had associated with this other uh, great monk uh, so you're saying this other person who was in a very high position uh, he was a general secretary of our order and uh, so much work and so much uh, problems and responsibilities so many things to deal with decisions to make all throughout the day and this monk told me this young monk he said i always saw that swami was so calm all throughout always uh, peaceful and relaxed he didn't get ruffled so i asked him how do you deal with it so much pressure and his answer was pratyahara 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 withdrawing the withdrawing is an inward turning away from the turmoil of the world then after pratyahara dharana dharana means uh, focus trying to hold on to the same thought at a stretch not allowing the mind to get scattered then this dharana deepens into dhyana dhyana means meditation then dhyana deepens into samadhi samadhi is the actual the, the purpose of meditation is to become absorbed in the object of meditation where you forget everything else there is no experience of the world no experience of the body and and at one point no experience of the difference between the meditator and the object of meditate meditation so this he uh, explains in a few verses from the 10th verse onwards and by the way he gives the importance of balance in life in the 16th and 17th verse he says if you eat too much you can't have meditation if you sleep too much you can't have meditation if you eat too little if you sleep too little sleep deprived you can't have meditation um and then he says a balanced life your daily routine must be balanced for meditation to work then he gives a beautiful example if there is one verse which is famous in this entire chapter it is this one the verse number 19 the example of the lamp the the unflickering flame of the lamp so what is the mind like in dhyana meditation and in samadhi he says yatha deepo nivatastho nengate sokma smrita so as the flame of a lamp it's it's burning it hasn't stopped burning it's burning but there's no wind there there's no breeze there so the the flame burns straight it doesn't flicker it's such a delicate thing even the slightest breeze and it will flicker but it's not flickering similarly the mind is awake you haven't fallen asleep but it's grasped one object of thought and it's that it's focused and you know in the radiance of god it's merged there it's not flickering away and going into something else again i'm using general terms but actually what it means is uh, you are the mind is not thinking of any object it is stilled in the pure subject i am this objectless awareness i am awareness i am consciousness in this radiance without any thought it's light but without any object to reflect that light no thought comes there that is the samadhi which is being spoken of here 
and then he gives some characteristics of that samadhi yatra uparamate chittam the mind becomes still no thoughts even good thoughts are not there mind is still so is it blank have you fallen asleep no i am pure awareness it's indescribable but it, that's very clear you are more awake than you have ever been in life in fact one characteristic of this state is being awake that is the meaning of the term buddha the buddha means awake the one who has woken up another characteristic another feature of this samadhi he gives here is yatra jeva atmana atmanam pashyan atmani tushyati where the atman um, is revealed you the pure self you are shine forth revealed to the mind which is in samadhi mind which is absorbed in samadhi is irradiated as it were by your own light as the atman and it is um, it is full to the brim with a joy unspeakable another characteristic he says so is it a joyous state yes sukham atyantikam yattad buddhi grahya matindriyam this is the most extraordinary the acme of all bliss of of joy but it is not uh, something that is experienced through the contact of something you know the sense organs contacting seeing something gives you happiness tasting something gives you happiness um, you know sense objects give happiness not that kind it's also not the joy of thinking very very pleasurable thoughts or daydreaming uh, it's not that kind of joy it's not the joy of calling up pleasant memories not the joy of desiring something expecting to get nice things none of those things no object is present there and yet it is the most extraordinary joy ever then another characteristic he says najayavam sthitas chalati tattvata there the mind is uh, centered in reality atman is the reality and it does not move away from there that is samadhi if it moves away it is meditation but not samadhi yet very beautiful verse i gave a whole talk on this yam labdha cha param labham manyate nadikam tata once you have got it later when you come out of that samadhi you will know one thing for sure that which i have that which i am is there is nothing greater than that i have got the greatest thing in human life if you are theistic you will say i found god actually not in the sense i believe in god but i actually god has become real for me forever but in the vedantic terms i have realized the atman i am satchidananda like shankaracharya you can honestly now sing chidananda roopah shiboham shiboham i am of the nature of consciousness i am of the nature of bliss i am shiva i am shiva so you have got the greatest thing having got got which nothing greater remains to be got yasmin stito na dukhe na guru na api vichalyate centered in which the greatest of sorrows cannot shake you the greatest of shocks so the sorrows and shocks will keep coming in the world because of our past karma life will go on as long as you are in the body things will keep happening around you and some of those will be unpleasant but with reference to what you have found in this meditation in this enlightenment none of those things can shake you anymore uh, centered in which the greatest of sorrows cannot shake you anymore another characteristic of this samadhi he says dukkha sanyoga vyogam yoga sangitam is a play on the word yoga what kind of yoga is this this yoga is yoga sangitam this is called yoga which is dukkha sanyoga vyogam it is the vyoga the disconnect with the connection with sorrow yoga has one meaning of connecting joining when you are joined with sorrow that joining with sorrow has been disconnected this is called the connection called yoga <laughs> so i'll read out that phrase dukkha sanyoga vyogam yoga sangitam sangitam means known or termed yoga is termed as that which uh, cuts away the connection with sorrow then a bunch of beautiful a few beautiful verses i'll just read out you recollect we had spent a lot of time on them what do you get out of all this what is the result all right samadhi i found this great thing so what what is the net result what have you gained out of the spiritual pursuit what is the result what is the benefit of enlightenment he says 
सर्वभूतस्थमात्मानं सर्वभूतानि चात्मनी ईक्षते योग युक्तात्मा सर्वत्र समदर्शन द वन हु इज एनलाइटेंड सीज ऑल बीइंग्स इन द सेल्फ एंड द सेल्फ इन ऑल बीइंग्स यू सी द वननेस एवरीबॉडी एवरीथिंग इज नथिंग अदर देन यू यू आर देयर इन एवरीबॉडी एंड दे आर ऑल इन यू समदर्शन यू सी द सेम एवरीवेयर सेम मींस द सेम डिविनिटी एवरीवेयर यो मां पश्यति सर्वत्र सर्वं च मयि पश्यति तस्याहं न प्रणश्यामि स च मे न प्रणश्यति टॉकिंग अबाउट द रिजल्ट्स ऑफ एनलाइटनमेंट यू द वन हु सीज दैट वन डिविनिटी एवरीवेयर एंड सीज एवरीथिंग इन दैट डिविनिटी दैट वन इज ऑलवेज कनेक्टेड टू मी कृष्ण सेज इज ऑलवेज इन मी इन गॉड आई एम नेवर लॉस्ट टू हिम ही इज नेवर लॉस्ट टू मी विल आई विल आई एवर कम डाउन फ्रॉम दैट स्टेट इट्स नॉट अ स्टेट इट इज रियलिटी and so you can there's no question of slipping away from that state it's it's there forever it was there we didn't know it it's just been uncovered and then the beautiful verse we talked about it the golden rule it is the you know central ethical rule of all religions around the world from most ancient times till now so the golden rule is found here the 32nd verse 32nd verse of 6th chapter you find the golden rule atma upamena sarvatra samam pashyati yojuna sukham va yadi va dukkham sa yogi paramo mata that is the greatest yogi who sees the sorrow and the happiness of others just like one's own sorrow and happiness treat others as you would have them treat you and you feel the sorrow of others as you feel your own sorrow the golden rule there is a difference between what is the common sense approach is that i'll treat them well if they treat me well i'll treat them badly or ignore them if they treat me badly i'll give them what they deserve nothing wrong in this but this is um, the conventional approach the spiritual approach is the golden rule is not how they treat me how i want to be treated by them i will treat them like that how would i want to be treated by others i will treat others like that doesn't depend on what they are doing it is my practice it is my spirituality it is my philosophy this is spiritual life this is the golden rule then arjuna asks two questions very important and the chapter concludes with that first question is all this is great krishna but it's not practical none of this works because all of it is predicated upon calming the mind focusing the mind upon the success of meditation and meditation is very difficult it's like trying to control the wind and krishna acknowledges it is difficult arjuna but it is possible vairagya and abhyasa uh, systematically practice it daily meditation morning evening or mon- in in our ashram in hollywood they meditate three times a day one hour in the morning one hour in the afternoon one hour in the evening and that's for everybody there so we meditate systematically that is repeated practice we discussed this on uh, you know extensively in one class why repetition is so powerful in yoga not knowledge not classes not lectures or books but repetition is powerful that is yoga and the other thing is dispassion unfortunately a lot of new age spirituality though it's very liberal uh, very liberating all this, it's all very great but it's also pretty worldly so nobody talks about um, dispassion the unworldliness the Uh, stop chasing uh, things in the world uh, stop begging the world for happiness and going around with a uh, begging bowl and asking for a little bit of happiness from the world no this passion i do not want and why not that we have discussed what is the problem with things in the world what is the problem with sense objects uh, what is the problem which if also the fact that doing this being worldly has not helped anybody look around you look in history look around the people around you and let us look at our own lives it has not amounted to anything at all in this in our lives so vairagya dispassion then the final question which arjun asks the second question um, is also an important question and it's rather touching you know he says that suppose i do not become enlightened then what happens to me what will happen to me this is a question we will uh, 
we ask, especially when we start spiritual practices earnestly and we progress and then we realize it's a long road. Then what? Then what? What is ahead of us? And Krishna answers with great positivity. He says, never fear. The one who walks on this path will never be lost. It's guaranteed by God. It's a divine guarantee. No other path has any guarantee at all. All other paths, they are all lost. They'll be, they'll be, whirl, be whirled around in this um, samsara of death after death. But this path, there's nothing lost. You don't have to begin from scratch all over again. You go on. What the best of worldly people will get in uh, heaven, you will get all of that. And then you will get another chance and as many chances as you want. And at, in each of those chances, you build upon whatever you have got in past lives. And also guaranteed, at the end of it all, you will become enlightened. You will attain to uh, self-knowledge, God, God realization, whatever you call it. So be a yogi. That is Krishna's exhortation to Arjuna. Sixth chapter. Let's see if there is any comment. Gita Dev says, is Pratyahara similar to Uparati in, in Shat Sampati? Exactly. Uparati means, Rati means flowing out into the world, delighting in the world. So that's great. No, it's not great. <laughs> it keeps you perpetually engaged in the world. So one must be able to detach. You must be able to throw yourself into work, into work, relationship. Um, into building a, a family, a career, all of that is possible, wonderful. But also should be able to detach, should not be dragged here and there by samsara. So, pratyahara is the ability to withdraw, turn away. Bill says, is pratyahara bringing the mind back when we notice it has strayed from God? No, that is part of dharana, focus. When it strays, you bring it back. It strays again, you bring it back. But pratyahara is when the mind and the senses are feeding. Ahara means to feed. It's feeding on the world. You stop it and turn it. With, pull, up, pull out these tentacles which we have sent out into the world. Pull these tentacles back. With a firm attitude, I don't want. What? Anything at all. From, from you, O oh world. <laughs> with that attitude, you must meditate. One Swami said, when you sit for meditation, imagine in your chest there is a sign, no admission. So the world has no admission into you during the time of meditation. Gloria says, is all the training of karma and bhakti preparation for being able to make the best use, possible use of God realization? Um, it makes God realization possible. Let me use specific terms here. When we're talking about Advaita Vedanta. So, Brahma Jnana or Atma Jnana, realization of the self, the real self, the capital S, that becomes possible if the mind has been purified through Karma Yoga and if the mind has been focused through um, Raja Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. Um, just one point here, I mentioned it earlier. It's said in a sequence, but that does not mean you have to spend 20 years in Karma Yoga and you know, 10 years in Bhakti Yoga and then 5 years in Raja Yoga. Then you come to the Vedanta class. No. That's the counsel of despair. You can't do that. We must do all at the same time. There must be, a, because we have a component of work in our life. We have a component. We are, have the capacity to love. We have the capacity to study and understand. Plus, we must develop this ability to withdraw into silence at least twice or thrice a day. So all the four yogas must be there in our life. Good. I suspect that Gloria was asking a slightly different question. That the, all this training in karma and bhakti will help you to make use of God realization. And I wouldn't like the term making use of God realization because after enlightenment, what will happen will happen by the will of God. You don't have to worry about the enlightened person. They are perfectly all right. What they will do, everything is blessed. But you have a point. If that's what you wanted to ask, you have a point. Um, the devotional practices and the selfless activities, they really blossom, they flower forth after enlightenment. That person can do tremendous amount of good to others, which was karma yoga for him earlier, now becomes 
a source of great good to others, blessings for others. And the bhakti, which was a devotion to God in order to become enlightened earlier. Now there's no need for anything to ask anything from God. Then it becomes true love of God for the sake of love. That is the highest form of bhakti. So after enlightenment, Advaitic enlightenment, that karma yoga becomes a great blessing for everybody. That bhakti yoga becomes the highest love, the highest real bhakti, para bhakti. Then. Maybe that's what you're asking. All right. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu